Good morning, this is Pastor John Townsend with First Grace Brethren Church in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Welcome you to our Sunday School Hour. We are having our Sunday School Focus this morning uh, out of uh, Cook's, David C. Cook's lesson books. And our lesson today is lesson number seven. And it's called in authority, called in authority. So we invite you to be with us. Uh, this is for Sunday, uh, January the 20th. Okay, had to get my date straight. Didn't quite remember it there. So we're here at uh, Sunday, January the 20th. I'd like to read to you from our uh, teacher's quarterly here on what they have here under Understanding Bible to get you caught up a little bit to where I am before we get started. One of the dilemmas that Jesus faced early in his ministry was the tendency of people to focus more on what he could do to meet their physical needs rather than on what he could do to address their spiritual needs. Many are enamored by the miracles that he performed and followed him primarily to witness those miracles or to benefit from them personally. Few seem to understand that the wholeness Jesus came to provide had more to do with the spiritual health than with their physical health. The process of being made spiritually whole would, uh, whole would not occur, however, unless they understood their need for forgiveness and the means he was going to provide to make that happen. Jesus use the incident recorded in today's message and the miracle he performed as an opportunity to reveal who he is. He wasn't just a man who had the spirit of God dwelling in him. He was in fact God. And in it all, Jesus showed that he has the desire and authority to make people whole. Okay, and then in your student books, if you'd like to follow along with us, uh, we're on page uh, 47. Uh, again, lesson seven, called an authority. <clears throat> we often hear the wonderful stories of how God intervenes in people's lives. My wife had cancer in the past. Uh, the pastor came to the hospital to pray for her. And now, four weeks later, she's healed. Praise the Lord. God is good. Or, my son was healed or headed in the wrong direction. My husband and I felt helpless. We didn't know what we could do about it, but we asked the church to pray for him. Three months later, he walked into our worship service. The preacher's message cut to his heart, and he gave his life to Christ. I'm so grateful for what God has done in our lives. Or some will say, I'm 88 years old and I feel just as strong as I did when I was 60. God has blessed my life so much. God is good. Stories like these are told so we'll be inspired and so we'll believe that God is active and involved in the lives of his people. But deep down, some of us are left to wonder, what about me? How come God doesn't do stuff like that for me? Doesn't he care? Isn't he willing to take away my cancer? Isn't he willing to make my life better? I would con conjecture that this paralyzed man used to think thoughts just like that. Most of us don't question Jesus' authority. We don't have that hard of a time believing that he can work powerfully in a life. What we sometimes have a hard time believing is that Christ wants to work powerfully in our lives. And he wants to make us whole. But just as Jesus cared for the man that, uh, who was made whole, but just, excuse me, just as Jesus cared for the man who was paralyzed whole, he can, we can trust he will do the same in us. 
questions that our author gives us here are number one, in what areas do we want to be made whole? Areas where we sense that something is lacking and we need help or we want to be complete? What makes it hard sometimes to believe that Jesus wants to make us whole in those areas? Number three, what would make it easier to believe that Jesus can and wants to make us whole? So in other words, those are uh, self-questioning uh, um, questions to ponder and questions even to think about as we go through the day's lesson, as we pick up on what Jesus wants us to learn in the book of Mark chapter 2, okay? So in Mark chapter 2, we want to begin reading with verses 1 through 4. And I've got four points here. <coughs> Excuse me, that we want to look for in this uh, reading in Mark. Early in his ministry, Jesus became known as a miracle worker who could cast out demons and heal the sick. Secondly, Jesus soon found it difficult to enter into villages without gaining unwanted attention from those more interested in his miracles than in his words. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a crowd gathered at the home where he was staying. Four men carried a, par a paraplegic friend who couldn't reach Jesus because of the crowd. And so they dug a hole in the roof and lowered the man down on a mat through the roof. Okay, and then in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. A few days later, when Jesus entered into Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such a large number that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. And some men came, bringing him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him into Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the man on his mat that he was lying on. All righty. Again, the questions, if we're going to pick out the points that we mentioned earlier, Question number four, what may have prompted some to follow Jesus early in his ministry? Well, the working of miracles. Uh, they saw miracles and they wanted to follow the miracle worker, okay? How did Jesus respond? Well, he responded by, uh, he spent more time away from the villages because he didn't want people just looking for miracles, okay? Okay. And why do you think that he responded that way? Well, again, his reason was to avoid the crowd that were enamored by the miracles. He, he was seeking to reach people with spiritual truths and spiritual growth and not just be uh, someone who, who met everyone's need. He, he did that when there was a need and he came upon it and people came to him and they had faith. He met it. But he wanted to drive home the idea and the thought that, you know, I'm here to help you spiritually. I'm here to draw you back through me to God the Father so that you can have fellowship once again with the God who created you as Adam did before the fall. And to carry that uh, fellowship on through eternity. Okay. Question number six. How would you characterize the four who carried the... Par paraly uh, the paralyzed man to Jesus. Okay, they wanted to help their friend. Okay, that's the way I do it, and that's why our author did it here. They believed Jesus could heal him, and they wanted to help their friend, so they did whatever was necessary to get him close to Jesus. And then as we continue on reading in Mark 2, we're going to read uh, verses 5 through 7. We're going to pick out four more points here. Jesus used this incident to bring into focus who he is and his message that he came to proclaim. By, saving, uh, by saying to the paralegic, sins be forgiven, Jesus claimed he was God 
as only God has the authority to forgive sins. Those hearing Jesus make this claim understood, and according to the law, this could only have been done or made uh, by Jesus, which made him guilty of blasphemy. Okay? Jesus wanted to do more than just heal the paraplegic physically. He wanted to make him whole spiritually. Okay? Good thing to remember as we continue on here uh, in our world today. A lot of churches are so busy meeting the physical needs of the people, they forget about or they go lax on meeting their spiritual needs. God calls men to come to him in salvation. He calls men to come to him in truth. He calls men to come to him once they've accepted him as Lord and Savior in holiness and purity and piety. And we need to stress those points. We need to help people spiritually as well as meeting those physical needs that they have. Okay? Okay, Mark 2, 5 through 7 reads, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, What does this fellow talk, or why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Okay? So we'll look at questions number 7, 8, and 9. Question 7, our author asked the question, Why was Jesus' primary reason for saying he could forgive sins, uh, forgive the man's sins? What was his primary reason for that? He wanted people to focus on his, on Jesus' true nature. He didn't want them focusing on the miracle worker. Uh, that, that was a result of his nature. Uh, that's some attributes of himself. But his true nature is that he is God. God incarnate. God, Emmanuel, God with us. Okay, So he wanted people to look at him that way. And Jesus was saying and stating it very plainly before those who were listening. I am God. Jesus is God. Question number eight. How did those well-versed in the scripture respond? Well, they were set back, I'll tell you. Uh, they understood that Jesus was claiming to be God, and they said right out, you're, you're, you're blaspheming. You're blasphemous. You know, and, and they wanted to start seeking to destroy him uh, once again because he was blaspheming, saying he was God. And he had the right to, but they didn't think he did. So they thought he was blaspheming. And uh, question number nine, what may have been the secondary part purpose for what Jesus said? Number one, first purpose, know my true identity, who I am. Look at the true person of Jesus Christ, God. Secondly, Jesus wanted to do something more. He wanted to make the person that he was dealing with, the crippled man, he wanted to make him not only physically whole, but he wanted to make him spiritually whole. Now to do that, we have to understand who it is that's making us or this man whole. We have to understand that Jesus Christ, Jesus, was in the beginning with God, and he was God. All things were made by him, and there was nothing made that was made except by Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. God the Father, number one. Second person of the Godhead, God the Son, Jesus Christ. And then the third person of the Godhead, God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Okay? But you and I have to realize, uh, as uh, Jesus put it in John 3, we have to believe. We have to believe that Jesus is the Almighty God, our Creator, our Sustainer of life, the Lover of our souls. Jesus is God. 
Now, once we look at him and truly believe that, and we accept him as Lord of our life, and we receive the salvation that he made possible on the cross of Calvary, then it's up to us to live what we believe. In other words, if we believe that Jesus is God and we accept him as Savior and Lord of our life, then our lives are going to be different than what they were prior to salvation. We're going to live holy, pious lives, lives that would make God proud, lives that are in line with who Jesus is and how he lived. That's the evidence of our belief that we believe who Jesus is. The evidence is that we live for Christ. We follow after him. We take off the old man. We put on the new man. All right, we're going to read Mark 2, 8 through 12. And we will pick up these points as we read through this. Jesus would have been guilty of blasphemy if he wasn't God. Uh, they would have been true. If he wasn't God, he would have been guilty. Okay? That is, if it wasn't God. To prove their accusations were unjustified, he posed the question that they found difficult to answer. Okay? Healing the sick and forgiving sins are equally difficult. Neither is easy. But both are things only God can do. Jesus healed the man, proving that he was or has the power to forgive sins as well. In the process, Jesus provided ample evidence that he is God. Jesus revealed that he has the desire and the authority to make us whole. For our trust, our trust that he can do so is therefore not misplaced. If you trust Jesus, if you believe that he is God, if you put your trust in him and begin to live the way he tells you to, it's not misplaced because Jesus is God. He's proved that already. Now, we're going to read the verses here in Mark 2, 8 through 12. <clears throat> Excuse me just a moment. Immediately, Jews, uh, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said unto them, quote, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins be forgiven, or to say, Get up and take up your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, unquote. So he said to the man, I tell you, take up your mat and go home. He, the man, got up, took his mat, and walked out in the full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, quote, We have never seen anything like this. Unquote. Okay, why did Jesus perform this miracle? Because he wanted to provide evidence. He wanted to provide proof. Evidence of his true nature. He is God. That he was, uh, has the desire and the authority to heal and forgive. Okay? So in other words, he wanted to change the focus of the people around him. Uh, take it away from the miracles. Don't just look at miracles. Uh, I can perform them, yes. But I want you to see the spiritual, the spiritual things that we're doing. The spiritual healing. Not only is this man who couldn't walk, able to walk, but his sins are forgiven. And he has a clean slate. And if he will move on from this time forward, and in our day and age, by the help and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live lives that are sinless if we will. Okay? Now, is there a sinless man in this world? No, there's not. Because we fail. That's why God gave us the scripture in 1 John 1, 9. 
And he's talking to Christians there. He said, but if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? If you will confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So there is a daily cleansing after we're saved because we do slip and stumble. But from the moment that we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to sin. We only sin because we allow ourselves to. Okay? But we do have a correction for that. As a matter of fact, that's what the foot washing talks about. A daily cleansing of sin for born-again children of God. Okay. See if I can catch back up where I am here. Question number 10. Why did Jesus perform this miracle? Okay, I just gave you that to provide evidence that he was God and to turn men's minds towards the spiritual. Why were the accusations of blasphemy without merit? Why weren't they true? <laughs> because Jesus is God. That's very simple. I mean, you can't call Jesus a, a, a blasphemy, uh, that he, or tell him he's blaspheming, that he's lying, that he's taking all the credit for something that he's not, if he is. And Jesus is God. So that it doesn't have a point there. Number 12. What implication does this instant, uh, incident have for us? Well, in our lives, Jesus can do both. Yes, he can heal uh, physically. He is the great physician. And yes, God does do miracles in our day and age. If we pray and it's within God's will for us to be healed, he will, can, and does heal us physically. But not only that, and foremost actually, he heals spiritually. Jesus saves us from Adam's original sin, and he sanctifies and justifies us and saves us from the penalty of our personal sin. Whether it was before we were saved, when it's washed under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, or whether it's those times that we slip. And, and we do what my grandmother used to say. Uh, we used to have a pretty good uh, conversation, my grandmother and myself. And she said, Christians don't sin. And for the longest time, I'd sit and say, Grandma, the Bible tells us that Christians do sin. You know, no, Christians don't sin. Until finally one day, when we were having this discussion back and forth, uh, I said, Grandma, Christians do sin. We've got 1 John 1, 9 to help us and cleanse us from our sin, uh, you know, and bring us back to Jesus there if we do. She said, Johnny, Christians don't sin. They make mistakes. <laughs> okay, they make mistakes. So she was using a little bit of terminology there, okay? And we, we, we didn't have our, our, our uh, uh, I forgot my, my word for study of words, but uh, synapses all together there. She was saying make mistakes, and I was saying sin. But yes, we fall short of the glory of God after we're saved, but we are still uh, cleansed and made whole again by Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. Oh, praise the Lord. All righty, let's go to our closing page here on page 52 of your books and read together how Jesus makes us whole. There are many ways that Jesus makes us whole. First, and perhaps foremost, Jesus makes us whole by forgiving our sins. In the process, he takes away the justification for us to carry a load of guilt about our past sins or beating ourselves up emotionally for what we've done wrong. He makes us whole by giving guidance on what is good, right, and true, by calling us to acts of faith so that this is so, and by promising that the outcome will be far better than that which would have occurred if we'd followed our own concept of right and wrong. Jesus makes us whole by promising a future that is far better than anything we can experience in this life. Jesus says that there are far better days ahead. 
Even though the best will not happen until we enter into eternity with him. Jesus makes us whole by giving our lives purpose and meaning. He emphasizes that we have been placed where we're at for a reason and that he wants to use us in the ways that we are fruitful, that are fruitful for us, others, and him. Jesus makes us whole by encouraging us when we are down, by comforting us when we are grieving, by giving us strength when we are weak or weary. He is there when we feel lonely and promises always to be with us no matter what. Jesus makes us whole by changing us into his likeness, something that doesn't result from his working hard or, or, or to be good, but it happens when we surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit who indwells uh, us within us. All of these things take time. They don't happen instantaneously. And they can and will result when we fully trust that Jesus has the desire and the authority to make us whole. Okay. Now, uh, questions 13, 14, and 15. Uh, that's sort of a test to see what you what you grabbed a hold of in this lesson. Uh, what are you waking, walking away with? Are you have you got the points that uh, Jesus was trying to make and our author was trying to uh, make more plain to us here? Uh, question thirteen: Have you already been made whole by Jesus? Have you been saved? Have you accepted Christ? It says, explain your answer. What are some additional areas? Where you still need him to make you whole? Where are the places that you're falling short of the glory of God and you still need growth and maturity? Think about that. For, uh, let the Holy Spirit bring them out and then follow his lead, the Holy Spirit, as he guides you into changing your life and your heart and your being. Question 15. What can you do so that you are contributing to the process of being made whole by Jesus. In other words, what's your part? What is your part? Well, my part is to yield to the Holy Spirit. And when God tells me that he wants me to stop something, I do my best to stop it. I work at it. When he tells me he wants me to take something on, I work and, and, and develop that and I become what he wants me to become. This world is a time of growth and maturity and preparation for who you're going to be in eternity where you'll serve God forever and ever. You're preparing that right here. You make the first step when you accept him as Lord and Savior of your life. But from that moment on, you are in preparation for living for God, not only in this world, yes, for in this world, but not only that, but also throughout all eternity. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and direction. Thank you for our time in our Sunday school class. Thank you for the students that have tuned in and are listening here. And Lord, help us to understand by your Spirit what you would have us to do. And thank you, Lord, for giving us the strength, the wisdom, and the knowledge, and even the power through the Holy Spirit to do it. May you receive all praise, all glory, and all honor. Amen. All righty. God bless you folks until I see you again next time. You folks will wait just a minute. We'll have a lesson time for the youngsters. All righty. Hang on. We'll be with you in just a moment. God bless you. sit down and talk to the boys and girls a little while. You sit there and eat your oats a little bit and get you a drink of water. Had a good ride. Thank you. Thank you there.
Well, hello, pards, young ladies and young cowboys, cowboys and cowgirls. How in the world are you? Good to see you out today. Oh, you know, I was just talking to the adults down at the church, and we were talking about uh, God's Word. And uh, we come across in the book of Mark, chapter 2, and... Uh, verses about 1 through 8 or so. And Jesus got in a situation there whenever he was walking in this world. And he was preaching and teaching and talking to people about how to be good Christians. And uh, they brought, you, you may have heard this story before. Uh, your Sunday school teacher probably told you a little bit about it. But there were four men that came with a good friend of theirs that had been paralyzed all his life. He couldn't walk and had to be carried or sort of drug himself around everywhere he went. And so they came and they were going to take him into Jesus and get Jesus to heal him. But uh, they couldn't get to him because whenever they tried to get in there, the, the crowds were just pressed so far close to the front door and everything, they couldn't get in where Jesus was. So uh, one of them had a bright idea. He said, well, if we can't get him in there, i got a bunch of rope out here. So let's go get the rope, and we'll get up on the roof, and we'll tear open the roof and make a hole, and we'll let him down right in front of Jesus. And so they did that. You know why they did it? Because they believed that Jesus is God, and they believed that Jesus could heal him. So they wanted to get him in there so that Jesus could heal him if he if he desired to, okay? So they let him down there. Good friends. They were good friends, I tell you, to go through all that uh, for this man here. But when they let him down there, Jesus decided he was going to heal him, mainly because of the faith of his friends. They had faith in Jesus, and he decided to heal him. So he looked at the man. And he said, your sins are forgiven you. Oh, there was a bunch of preachers over in the corner over there. They were sort of looking at each other and they're thinking, who does this Jesus think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Well, Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he looked back at them and he said, what do you think is easier to say? You think one's easier to say than the other? Either your sins be forgiven or take up your bed and walk. You're healed. I could have said either one of them. But Jesus said, I said to that man, your sins are forgiven. Number one, because sin is what got him into the situation he was in. But the main reason I wanted to do it right here rather than just say, Take up your bed and walk. He said, I wanted you fellas to know who I am. Jesus said, I want you preachers to know that I am God. And let me tell you something, partner. That's something we all need to understand right from the get-go. Jesus is himself God. As a matter of fact, back in the book of John, if you'll open your Bibles in John chapter 1, or if you're not reading yet, you get mom and dad to read it to you. It records there, it says, in the beginning was the Word. Now that Word there, it's talking about Jesus. He's the living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. Now that's God telling you in his word in the Bible that Jesus Christ is God. He's God's son. And that's what he wanted these guys to believe. So because these four friends had faith in Jesus and because this man had faith in Jesus and he believed that Jesus was God Jesus told him, he said, your sins be forgiven you. Take up your bed and walk. Now, little cowboys and cowgirls, God still does that today. 
he still heals. Doctors do a whole lot of it, and God will use the doctors and their medicines and some of their shots and all these things, you know, to help. But God heals. That's why we, whenever we have friends that we know, maybe family members that are sick, we pray. We pray that God will, in his abundant mercy and his grace towards us, will heal the people that we pray for. Okay? Let's pray right now. Gracious Heavenly Father, I give you praise, I give you glory, I give you honor. You are the one and only true God. I believe that. And I believe you have not only the power to forgive sins, but you have the power to heal. And there are a lot of people that we know that are sick and not feeling good, and they need your healing. Our whole planet needs healing from this uh, virus that's going around and all these viruses that are making people sick. So we pray, Father, if it be your will, that you might heal each and every one. And we give you praise and we give you thanks and we glorify your name for doing what you do for us. For I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you young cowboys and cowgirls will just say your prayers every night. And as I remind you every week here, always remember to obey your mom and dad. For this is right and it's the first commandment with promise. Okay? God bless you. Until we meet again.